We got 14 seconds. Well, good morning. We're glad that you're with us this morning. Isn't it good to feel the coolness of the air? Uh, I got up and went walking with our uh, grandchildren yesterday afternoon, and somebody already had their fireplace going. Oh, man, I said, that smells good. And I was praising God because uh, we get a chance to live in a position, in a place where we get to experience all four seasons. Uh, It's almost like God changes it just because He knows we need something new. If you've ever... uh, haven't realized the book of Psalms is probably the best place to go camp out if you're not doing well or if you want to be able to be led into a praise a kind of atmosphere with the Lord because all throughout the Psalms that's exactly what's happening so there are, there are 150 Psalms so how will the psalmist and we said this a couple of Sundays ago that these Psalms are not just written in a season they're written in multiple hundreds of years and gathered together but how will the psalmist end the great book of psalms turning your bibles to psalm 150 the very last psalm when all is said and done in the other 149 psalms the psalmist that writes this psalm says this he says praise the lord praise the lord bottom line praise the lord he says praise god in his where sanctuary He says, praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet and sound. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with tremble and dancing. Praise Him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. And let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Notice how the psalmist ends the book of Psalms even though there are multiple authors in the book of Psalms. The bottom line, last three words in the book of Psalms is this, praise the Lord. So no matter what your situation may be today, the writer of the Psalms, all of them would look at you this morning and very simply say those three words, praise the Lord. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the coolness of the air. We thank you for your way that you have provided for us. Even yesterday as we were walking, I was praising you that throughout all of this, the renovations that took place in here, uh, drive-in church and patio church outside, you have been faithful. Uh, You've been faithful to give us Sunday after Sunday after Sunday of excellent weather. Uh, Friday and you know, Thursday, Friday, it was raining. Yesterday was a beautiful day. It's almost like you reserved this time, this place, for your name to be praised. So that's what we do this morning, Lord. We come together to do exactly what the psalmist says to do at the end of the book of Psalms. We come together today to praise your name. Amen. Uh, look at your bulletin real quick before Jerry comes up and uh, leads us in how we can get some prayer requests in and also how in case today would be the day you decide to make Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. If you look at the back of your, if you look at the back of your uh, bulletin, uh, you'll notice that we have another drive-up registration for Awanas uh, this coming Wednesday night from 4 to 7 p.m. Then Awanas will kick off the next Wednesday night, which is September 30th. Also, I remind you to circle October the 4th, which is the first Sunday in October. So leaders, all of our meetings have been pushed back to the second Sunday. At 2 o'clock, the pumpkins are going to arrive. I talked to Buck this week. And uh, they're actually, if you've ever been here when the Christmas trees are out there, you know how well it's lit up. Uh, they're actually going to borrow those lights for the pumpkin patch. Buck says he wants to move the start time back some and then keep it lay open later in the evening because it'll be uh, lit. Uh, but we do need your help unloading uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pumpkins. That's one of the ways that we impact this community for Christ is through the pumpkin patch. So we need your help that day. If you look down at uh, our giving, uh, our stewardship team spent a lot of time uh, the last week working on revamping the MIP. In other words, when you look at that number of 16,311 being uh, a deficit, that, that's not a really true number. And we, and we don't want to portray anything that's not true because a lot of the money that's in the MIP is not going to be spent this year. Uh, vacation Bible School, Central Kids, Youth Camp, 
all different harvest fest is another one that's in the MIP that you've been giving toward. So by next Sunday, hopefully we'll have a true figure in there. That number of 16,000 is going to change quite a bit as you get a true look at what's been spent and what we still have to spend for the rest of the year. Plus, uh, you'll also see that the weekly amount needed is going to drop slightly. Uh, so uh, you'll see that that will change too. We've got uh, probably about 15 or more weeks left to finish the year. And again, we want to finish the year in a positive note. Uh, Jerry, come on up and uh, tell us about the telephone number. It's going to come up on the screen. And also uh, pray for us. And I'm going to come up and highlight Acts 1. Pastor Bill is going to lead us in worship. Then we'll, we'll be ready to spend some time in the Word. Good morning. It's uh, really great to be back and uh, to see you all this morning. Uh, I do want to thank you. I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for uh, your prayers for uh, myself and my family. Um, it was a, a wonderful memorial service and my, my brother gave me the opportunity uh, to speak at the end of the memorial service and I, I brought a message of hope that we have as believers in Christ and then I was able to uh, share the gospel with anyone there that uh, was not saved and hopefully as a result of that someone came to know the Lord um, this morning I want to point out to you if you're here with us on the back of your bulletin there's a number where you can text your prayer request and more importantly at the end of the service if you have any questions about how to receive Christ as your Savior please call that number and we will make arrangements to meet with you uh, if you're watching on Facebook Live. I believe the number is at the bottom of the screen, and uh, that is available uh, for you as well. So um, let's uh, open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for your love and your matchless grace, Father. We thank you for this time that we have now to come together to worship you through. Uh, the teaching of your word and through singing of hymns and praises to you, Father. I just uh, pray that this time will be special to us, that we would seek your face, Father, and that you would guide us and lead us through all that we say and do, Father, that it may bring you glory and honor. And we just uh, commit this time now into your hands, for it's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's... Uh... If I were to ask you this morning, what am I standing on? I'm this right here below my feet, what would you say? Platform. Stage, platform, all right. Uh, very good. Uh, if you um, know anything about our church family, every month we have an Acts 20 ministry focus. And this particular month is Virgin Vision Virginia. Our goal is $2,100. And uh, that word platform, if you take a look at it, is exactly what Vision Virginia does. Uh, the state goal is about $400,000. Every, every dollar of that goes into building platforms to get the gospel out. Every one. Let me give you an example. Uh, our annual homecoming, uh, which if you've never gone to one of those, you're missing a treat. We've got some phenomenal speakers lined up, phenomenal singing artists lined up. Uh, you can do that online. Uh, so we'll get that information out to you. It's in November, but you can, uh, you can view that online. That's how I'm going to view it this year. That's how Diane will view it this year. We're not going to go there in person. It's up in Chesterfield, and every year what they do is the Saturday before the event kicks off on Sunday afternoon, they have what's called crossover whatever city it is. And uh, every church that's there early will go out and minister to that community that that church is in. They use that platform to share the gospel. When you think about Vision Virginia, there are 14 different platforms that are built. Anything from uh, ministering to the deaf. If you uh, read my email from the other day, there are over 100,000 deaf people in the state of Virginia. How are they going to hear the gospel? Well, we actually have deaf pastors that are being trained to minister to the deaf community. How is that done? Vision Virginia. Uh, we also have a number of other different ways. If you're a church planter, uh, church planting is an adventure. It is a roller coaster ride because you start with nothing 
And SBCV says, well, you know, we'll get you some uh, worship equipment that you need. You know, we'll get you, you, we may pay for the trailer that you need. All that money comes out of the platform of Vision Virginia. So you know how deep to my heart church planning is. So when Diane and I write our check this year for Vision Virginia, that will be on our minds. We'll be making our collection of that Acts 1-8 ministry focus next Sunday. Uh, just annotate on your check. Make it out to VVBBC. Annotate uh, Vision Virginia at the bottom. 100% of that money goes directly to our state convention that puts more church planners on the field, feeds more hungry families. We, have a, we had a high school uh, or that all of a sudden had to shut down. Even their feeding program, they, they basically were feeding the community, the kids in that school, they were feeding them even during the midst of this. They had one of their workers that came down with COVID, they had to shut everything down. So how are those children going to eat? Vision Virginia stepped in with the local church. That local church picked up the ball, fed that community till they could get back on their feet. That's what you're giving, you give to Vision Virginia. Let's stand to our feet. Let's sing some praises to the Lord. There we go. As Pastor was talking about psalms ending in praise, you know, sometimes when we're in those dark places, it's hard to give praise. But you see, we serve an awesome God who gave us His Word, His Son, and His Holy Spirit. And then the community of believers to rally around us in those dark times, so that in those dark areas, that we can still stand and give praise to Him. It's called the Desert Song. my prayer in my hunger and need. My God is the God who provides. This is my prayer in the fire, in weakness or trial or pain. There is a faith
prayer in the harvest, when favor and providence flow. I know I'm filled to be emptied again. The seed I received, I will. leader just messed that up but that's all right you know what god's good will you just go ahead and have a seat we're going to come pastors are going to give a good word and make up for the mistake of the worship leader god amen please join me as we pray together heavenly father we bow before thee this morning to thank you for another day on this earth, to another opportunity to serve you. And part of that part is listen to your word and using this for guidance. So we're, we're confident that you've equipped Pastor Gordon in a mighty way. And we understand our responsibilities to listen and to take each and every word for action. Dear Lord, this is our prayer to thee. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Willie. Let me share something with you before we get into the word this morning. You know, um, how many of you have realized that this virus that we're under is not going to stop the gospel? Uh, last Sunday at our 10 o'clock service, we had five first-time guests. Five first-time guests uh, that were on our campus last Sunday. Uh, so in your bulletin this morning, there is a communication card. Uh, there are a couple of things that you can do if you're a first-time guest this morning. You can fill that out. Just let us know that you're here. That gets you to be prayed for. Even if you put nothing else on the card, on the back of that card, you can put in your prayer request or praises. Put that in the offering plate as you leave the sanctuary this morning. You know, we started out the first Sunday that we came back inside. The crowd is getting a little bit bigger every Sunday. Is that great or what? 
Amen to that. It is good to be back in the house of the Lord. Even though the house of the Lord is still out there, it's good to be back in the house of the Lord in the year. The year is 2008. Uh, uh, a church member and I and Diane were traveling to Roanoke to the annual homecoming. And my cell phone rang, and it was Don Cox, who was our uh, regional missionary at that time with SBCB. He said, Gordon, he said, I want you to think about planning a church. Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, well, this is November. There's nothing in the MIP for that. I can tell you that now. Uh, he says, we've got a young guy by the name of Jamie LaMotta. How many of you remember Jamie? Jamie LaMotta. I was going to plant a church on the ODU campus called uh, 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 Aletheia ODU. Uh, and he got him to come one Sunday and preach. And I said, Diane and I are going to commit this amount of money to this church plant for a year. It's not in the MIP. Will you join us? I think we needed 10 families at the level that Diane and I were going to give to, to make that work. We had well over that. But I'll never forget that Sunday, a 815 service, and it was about 8.05, and I get a call from Jamie Lamata, which is never good when the guy who's supposed to be speaking calls you at 8.05. <laughs> okay? uh, but, but we're always ready to preach. He said, Gordon, he, he said, uh, Gordon, I've got a problem. I said, what's that? He said, I'm sitting at a signpost on the way to church, and it tells me I can go right and get on Princess Anne Road, or I can go straight and get on Princess Anne Road, or I can go left. And... How many of y'all know that intersection? <laughs> I said, just come straight, brother. You'll see us. Just come straight. And a couple of minutes later, I told Pastor Bill that Sunday. I said, keep singing until he gets here. You know, just keep singing. So, um, but he made it here. But our key word for today in uh, our study of the book of Romans is that word signpost. Uh, everything in the Jewish religion, if you stop and think about it, God had designed as a signpost to point to Jesus. If you think about it, there are five things that he used as signposts. He used the sacrifices that the Jews would give as a signpost. And the reason it was a signpost is they had to continue to give uh, sacrifices ever so often because their forgiveness was not permanent. In Christ, that signpost says there's one coming, the Messiah, that will make a sin offering that will be permanent for you and anyone who believes in him. Even their priesthood, their, their priests were temporary. But the signpost points to Jesus and says there's coming one who will be a permanent high priest. Even their temple services, if you study those out, even the temple services point toward Jesus. Their religious festivals, the things they celebrate, their covenants, all five things were signposts that God used to point the Jewish people to one that was coming. But the fatal flaw for the Jew, as we've seen in the study of the book of Romans, is they begin to worship the signpost and not the one coming. They began to worship the sacrifices. They were began to worship the priesthood, the temple services, the religious festivals, the covenants, all those things they began to worship, forgetting that that was a signpost pointing to someone else. Well, how would Paul, you can turn to Romans chapter 10, how would Paul get his point across to his Jewish readers in particular that the law that the law was impossible to make us righteous. If you were with us last Sunday in Romans 10, 1 through 4, we saw that. We saw that. I mean, he says you can seek your own righteousness through the law. You can do that if you decide to do it. But you will always fall short of being righteous in God's eyes. Join me in Romans chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 5, 6, 7, and 8 this morning. As we continue in our study in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 5, follow along as I read. He says, For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on what? The law shall live by that righteousness. In that one sentence, Paul encapsulates what he said in Romans 10, 1 through 4. He says, if you make a decision to live by the law, to try to earn your righteousness by the law, then you must fulfill the law on your own to become righteous in the sight of God. Now, how will Paul get his point across? He reaches back into the Old Testament and pulls up a man who is really the lawgiver. He is the one the law was given to. He was a patriarch. His name is Moses. He says, listen, he says, even if you don't believe what I'm saying in Romans 10, 1 through 4, let's go back and take a look at what Moses says. And then he begins to quote Moses. He says, listen, he says, if you are going to practice the righteousness of the law, in other words, those Ten Commandments that are on the, 
on the uh, wall on the way out of our sanctuary on the other side. He says, if you're going to say, this is going to be my code, this is how I'm going to live, this is, uh, this is how I will earn my righteousness before God, I will stand before him someday, and I will say, I've kept all of your commandments. That is impossible. That is impossible. In his book, My Tortured Conscience, Martin Weber tells a story of a, of a deeply committed Christian evangelist. And uh, this guy was known, he, he wasn't a pastor in a church. He would do evangelistic conferences around the United States, and he would see hundreds, if not thousands, come to know Christ. He retired, and even in his retirement, he continued to lead people to Christ, even in his retirement, in his local community. But he gets up one morning, he, he gets his shotgun, and he gets ready to walk out of the house, and he tells his wife, he says, I'm going to go outside, I've got to go outside and kill a rat. And he kind of gives her a peck on the cheek, and she continues working in the house, and he goes out, and a few minutes later, she hears the gunshot, she thinks she went, he's got the rat. I didn't even know he had a rat, but he's got the rat. But, you know, eventually she noticed she hasn't seen her husband, and she goes outside, and he has killed himself. He was the rat that he had to leave to go kill. Now, here is a man who is the devoted Christian, no doubt was an evangelist leading others to Christ, but what would cause him to take his own life? The author goes on to say it's probably one of the saddest funerals that he'd ever attended for this devoted Christian evangelist. The constant question was, what made him pull the trigger? They found his diary, and I want you to listen to the last entry in his diary. It says, here I've been telling everyone else to keep the law, and I can't even keep it myself. What hope do I have in heaven? And he took his own life. See, the problem with the law is, as we've been saying, this man took his own life because of guilt. The law laid a ton of guilt on him. And he couldn't keep it. He couldn't keep it. Even if you stop and think about it, Jesus says, even if we have the thought without the action, have we violated the law? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. See, with the law, there are two things that are lacking. Mercy and grace. You read the law. There is no mercy in the law. There is no grace in the law. And what this man did was he tried to lead himself and others into keeping the law and earning their own righteousness by fulfilling the law. And he realized he fell desperately short of being able to do what he was telling everybody else to do. And finally, the guilt and the shame of that was too overwhelming. Look at Galatians. Join me in Galatians chapter 3. You're going to go to the right. You're going to go to the right. Where does that mercy, where does that grace come in the law? Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 10 through 14. It says, For as many as are the works of the law are under a what? Curse. Wow. For it is written, written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by, what's the next word? All things. Mm, written in the book of the law to perform them. Here, Paul, writing to the believers in Galatia, he says, the one who attempts to keep the law and fails is cursed. He goes ahead in Galatians 3, 10 through 14. He says, Not that, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident for, he goes on to quote again, the righteous man shall live by what? Faith. It's got nothing to do with the law. It's got everything to do with faith. Faith in the fact that Jesus Christ fulfills the law. And Paul lays this out for us next in Galatians 3. However, the law is not fulfilled, is not, is not of faith. On the contrary, who practice them shall live by them. Look at the next part. Christ, what's the next word? Redeemed. What does redeemed mean? To buy back, to purchase, uh, to, I mean, I've got a Chick-fil-A coupon. And I've got to, I mean, that's something I can take to Chick-fil-A and say, here's my coupon, I want my sandwich or my chicken strips or whatever else I want, okay? It's a coupon, but guess where it's sitting? It's sitting on my, in the pastoral office somewhere, okay? And I've got to find it because it expires in October. <laughs> I'm going to lose that on my sandwich if I don't go redeem the coupon, okay? They gave me a coupon, but it's my responsibility to redeem the coupon, right? It says here, it says, He who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the what? The curse. There's that word again. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. The law comes with a curse. 
And Christ steps in, and even though I can't live by the law, I cannot earn my own righteousness, Christ redeems me from the law. He buys me back from the law. He goes on to say in Galatians 3, 10 through 14, he says, For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You get the visual that Paul is speaking of there? Who is the one who hung on a tree? Christ is. So what he does, he takes the Old Testament, the Old Testament curse. He says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Did you get that? Might come to the Gentiles so that they would receive the promise of the spirit through faith. So see, when the law brings curse, Christ steps in and fulfills the law for us. Is there anything about the law that Christ did not fulfill? He fulfilled it perfectly, perfectly. And he says, I fulfill it perfectly for all those who place their faith in me. Well, then we have to ask the question, why does God give, and I want to answer to this, why does God give the law? If it's only going to bring a curse, if it's not going to bring a blessing, if, it's, uh, if it can only point out sin and not give mercy and grace, why in the world would God give us something like that? To realize our need for Christ. Uh, William has hit it right on the head. God gives us the law for this reason. In the law, his righteous character is revealed. Okay? And not my righteousness, but his righteousness is revealed. So when I put my, take a look at my life through the lens of the law, I fall short each and every time. And that's what happened to this evangelist. He was telling others how to come to Christ through keeping the law. And he couldn't keep the law himself. So all of a sudden, guilt and shame began to come upon him to the point he took his own life. Because there is no mercy and there is no grace. Think about this for a second. Try living tomorrow with no mercy and no grace. Just tell God, turn to mercy, spick it off for a day. Turn to grace, spick it off for a day. And let me just live without mercy and grace. We would soon find ourselves in the same position this man did earlier. The evangelist did. We would be overwhelmed with guilt. Overwhelmed with shame. But in comes Christ according to the book of Galatians. And it says, he became the curse for us. Amen? He became the curse for us. With the, God, with the law, God was telling humanity, this is what I require you to be to be declared the righteous in my sight. In other words, if you want to know how to be righteous in my sight, look to the law. If you want to know how to be righteous in my sight, look to the law. Now we know the law is broken down into two components. What's the first component? Our relationship with who? God. What's the second component? Ourselves. Isn't that amazing? That God says it's just not about your relationship to me. It's just not about Vertical. This is vertical, right? Yeah. The vertical. I always get those two confused. This is the vertical. Okay? Okay? The law points out several parts of being vertical. But then the lawgiver says there's also a horizontal perspective to that too. So when I ask myself, how is my relationship to God? I must also ask myself, how is my relationship to my brothers and my sisters? How is my relationship with my neighbor? How is my relationship with my coworkers? How is the relationship with the rest of my family? See, God gives us that law as a parameters of having a right relationship with him, but also eventually with the coming of Christ, how to have a right relationship with each other. I cannot have a single issue that we face in our world today that cannot be solved with the gospel. Every problem we face, let's take hunger. Can it be solved with the gospel? You bet. We just saw a church do that through Vision Virginia. I mean, here is a whole community of children who are used to having meals provided for them just like they would in school, okay? And all of a sudden, that just gets shut down. Well, what comes to the rescue? The gospel. And a church picks up, picks up that mantle and it says, we'll fulfill that. All right, how in the world is a church going to do that? Well, Vision Virginia comes in and says, listen, we're going to help you buy the food. We're going to help you get the supplies. Your people just get them out. We'll help you get what's needed. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that church impacting that community for Christ? You bet, because every door they knock on to take food to, they're taking the gospel to. And that's what every church needs to be doing. 
How can I take the tragedy that's happening in this community right now and turn it into a way to platform to share the gospel? Unfortunately, many of us don't want to be involved. Look at Romans 10, 6 through 8. You're going to have to turn back to the book of Romans. Romans 10, 6, uh, 6 through 8. Paul sets them up with this thought from Moses in Romans 10, uh, 10 5. He says, even Moses says, even Moses, the lawgiver, says, hey, listen, if you want to try to earn your righteousness by keeping the law, go ahead. But let me remind you that you must keep all of the law. Look at what he says in Romans 10, 6 through 8. But the righteousness based on what? The law? No, faith. Speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? This is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is, what's the next two words? The word is near you. Wow. In your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we are preaching. What Paul does here in Romans 10, 6-8, is he draws actually from the book of Deuteronomy. Turn in your book, Bible to the book of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is where a lot of Romans uh, 10, 6-8 is quoted from. Listen to what he says in Deuteronomy 30, verses 9 through 14. It says, Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly. Now, if I was sitting in your place and I wrote in my Bible, I would circle those three words, prosper you abundantly. I don't know about you, but anytime I read those words, I'm going to listen real well to what comes next because it's saying, if you do this, God is going to prosper you. Okay? It says there in Deuteronomy 30, the Lord will, your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hands and the offspring of your body and the offspring of your cattle and in the produce of your ground. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the Lord your God and keep his commands and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, If you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, for this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of your reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go, who will go up to heaven for us to get it, for us to make us, uh, for us and make us hear it, that we may observe it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it, for us and make us hear it, that we may observe it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. You know, when Paul pins these words in the book of Romans, and he's writing in particular Romans 9, 10, 11 to the Jewish heart, when the Jew hears this, you know what his mind is thinking? This guy is quoting from the book of Deuteronomy. This guy is quoting from one of the books of the law. Okay? So Paul takes that, 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 that portion of Deuteronomy and he brings it up to the New Testament and uses it as evidence for something he wants his Jewish readers to understand. It says, God says, if you do what I tell you to do. How many of you have ever said that to your children? Just do what I tell you to do and you'll be okay. If you do what I tell you to do, you're going to be all right. That's what God's saying here. Just do what I tell you to do. God says, if you do what I, te- what I tell you to do, I will prosper you. Is that how it ends? Uh-uh. What's the last word? I will prosper you how? Abundantly. Remember the cup that's pressed down and what? Running over? That's the view I get of that. That's the view I get of that. It's kind of like James 1.5. You know, that verse we use for wisdom. It says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it to all liberally. And he will give it to us in abundance? Is that amazing or what? Is that amazing or what? Here God says, if you do what I tell you to do, if you do what I tell you to do, I'm going to prosper you and just not prosper you. I'm going to prosper you abundantly. Now notice how the prospering occurs. The first thing he says, he says, I'm not only going to bless you. And this is getting into the second blessing thing, okay? In other words, because I've done what God's told me to do, I can expect his blessings upon my life, and I can also expect his blessings to go beyond my life. Because here it says, not only will I bless you, I'm going to bless your, what's the first thing after me? My offspring. 
How many of you want your children and grandchildren to be blessed? Do you realize that blessing may start with you? Do you realize that blessing can start with you? Oh, I hope my children will obey the Lord because if they do, they're going to be blessed. And their little eyes look at you and say, is He blessing you? Because He blesses you, He's going to bless me. Right? That's what the book of Deuteronomy says. That's why God can say, I'm going to bless, I will prosper you abundantly because the, the blessing just doesn't come to me. The prospering just doesn't come to me. It says, I will bless your offspring and the offspring of your cattle. And, is that, and that's not enough. He says, even the produce of the ground, I'll bless that abundantly too. So see, it's like a ripple effect when we're obedient to the Lord, isn't it? How, how, how that blessing goes to our wives and our children and our grandchildren and our community sometimes. I want that kind of blessing from God. How many of you do? Raise your hand. All right, now here's what it says. I want that kind of blessing, but God says to obtain it, I must do this. I must turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. That's all he says. He says, turn to the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Many of you may know the name uh, Bobby Bowden. He's a co- he was the coach of, Florida State's, of, of the Florida State Seminoles. He played baseball for Howard College. And he played freshman, uh, j- uh, sophomore, junior, senior. And the thing in that four years, he, was, he, he never hit a home run. He never hit a home run. So his senior year, out of everybody on the team, including the pitchers, he was the only one that had not hit a home run that year. They were playing Auburn, and he hits a pitch that goes between the left fielder and the center fielder and starts rolling toward the wall. And Bobby Bowden says, I know this was my chance to get a home run. Season's getting ready to close. So he rounds first, rounds second. And when he comes to third, the third base coach is telling him to go. But as he passes him, he says, and you'd better hurry up. And he slides in the home and he's safe. Everybody come off the bench. Here's the only player on the whole team, including the pitchers that hadn't had a home run that year. They're all slapping his back. They're all tapping him on top of the head. And the first baseman yells to the catcher, throw me the ball. Throws him the ball. He takes first base. The umpire says, batter's out. Bobby Biden, if I got to touch first base on the way around. And, and, you know, every year, every year in his book, he says, every year I drive that point home to my players. If you don't take care of first base, it doesn't matter what you do after that. Even though he touched second, you mean he's still out? Oh, yeah. Even though he touched third, you mean he's still out? Oh, yeah. Even though he touched home, is he still out? Oh, yeah, because he got first base. You see, that's what God is saying here. He says, don't forget first base. Now, who's first base? He is. He, God says, turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So let me ask you a question this morning. Don't answer this question. Have you touched first base? Have you made God what he's asked you to make him to be the consuming fire of your heart and of your soul? Then that same, verse, same verses in Deuteronomy, God gives us a word of encouragement. Don't tell me what it is. How many of you need a word of encouragement today? Raise your hand. I'll raise my hand <laughs> every time when somebody asks that question. Well, then God gives us a word of encouragement there in the book of Deuteronomy. Listen to what he says. For this commandment which I command you today is probably the most hardest thing you'll ever do in your entire life and you're probably going to fail at it. No, that's not what it says. It says, for this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of your reach. So God lays down this, turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You know, you may look at me today and say, you know, Gordon, I don't know if I can do that or not. I mean, I mean, I mean that's a pretty large request, right? To, to really turn my life totally over to God, my heart, my soul, everything. But in the book of Deuteronomy, we say that we're reminded that God also says that what he's asked us to do is not too difficult and it's not out of our reach. How can that be? How many of you understand that salvation is simple? Raise your hand. If it wasn't simple, nobody would understand it, right? You know, I, I like simple things. That's because that's who I am. I'm a simple person. I like simple things. Don't make things complicated, okay? Any more complicated than they have to be. Just give me simple. I like simple. Well, that's what God does here. In the next section from Deuteronomy, he says, listen, he says, um, he says, you don't have to go to heaven to find Christ. Why? 
Because Christ came to earth. Now, what do we call that? What theological term do we wrap that in? The incarnation. Can you imagine that? God taking on human flesh. Can you imagine that for a second? The God who spoke creation taking on human flesh. But then Paul also says, according to the book of Deuteronomy, you don't have to go down to the world of the dead to get Christ either. Now, what, what theological term are we talking about there? We're talking about the resurrection, right? Christ is not in a tomb, is he? That was weak. Okay, thank you. If Christ is still in the tomb, we got a problem. Okay? We got a problem, but he's not in the tomb. So here are two stumbling blocks that the Jewish reader is going to face. And Paul wraps them up beautifully, not from a writing in the book of Romans, but rather from a quote from the book of where? Deuteronomy. In other words, the Jewish mind would understand that. He probably could quote that. But it was two stumbling blocks that the Jews just could not get over. One is the incarnation that their God would send the Messiah in human flesh. Secondly, that their God would send the Messiah and the Messiah would have to be crucified, and then you're going to tell me that he was resurrected. And then he finishes with this. He says, but the word is very near you. In your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. Now, what is Paul setting them up for? What comes next? What will be next Sunday if the Lord tarries? Where will we be? I'll give you a hint. It's Romans chapter 10, and it's uh, starting in verse number 9. Jerry, you there in the scriptures? All right, read Romans 10, 9, and 10. Listen, listen in comparison to what he says here when he says, but the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. Read that, Jerry, the next portion. Do you see what Paul's setting them up for with the, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Here in the book of Deuteronomy, it says this. He says, but the word is very near you. It's not far away from you. And then he says those two words, mouth and heart. He makes a connection there in Deuteronomy that Paul will make over here in the book of Romans chapter 10. Paul's telling his Jewish readers, this is not new news. It's good news, but it's not new news. Because all the signposts, even in the book of Deuteronomy, are pointing to Jesus Christ and the fulfillment of everything that we just read a few minutes ago. All right, now, I want your total attention. I want your total attention. If I could take you by the chin right now, I'd do this, okay? Each one of you. If you hear nothing else of what I say today, I want you to focus on this next statement. God does not expect you to be perfect. You should have said amen. If God looked at you this morning and said, my expectation for you, William Whitmore, is perfection. I don't think we could handle that. Maybe you have a child. Maybe you have a child who their greatest fear in life is disappointing you then you may have a child who really doesn't care if they disappoint you or not. Uh, but their greatest fear in life is not any other punishment than the fact that, you have dis that I have disappointed you as my parent. God takes us by the face this morning. says, I have never and I will never expect you to be perfect. If you could be perfect, there would be no need for who? Christ. We could do it on our own, right? But there is a responsibility. He does not require us to be perfect, but he does expect our devotion. He does expect our devotion. You notice the difference? It says back in the book of Deuteronomy, turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Let me give you real quick a, a working definition of that word devoted. It means to be steadfast or single-minded in purpose or desire. And isn't that exactly what God says in the book of Deuteronomy when he says, turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? Isn't he talking about us being not perfect, but rather being devoted to him? 
In 2008, Sonia Richards Ross competed in the 400 meter event in Beijing uh, in the Olympics. Can you imagine that? Spending four years, spending your life training for an event that's going to last less than a minute. If you run the 400 in over a minute, you're not going to be in the Olympics. It's just not going to work. Okay? She had trained four years for the event. She started the race. She had a humongous lead. And then her right calf began to tighten up to the point where she could, she literally hobbled across the finish line. She received a bronze medal. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you would be satisfied with a bronze medal in the Olympics? It's 66? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe the senior Olympics. Okay. Um, but, you know, she didn't get, she didn't get deterred from her, from her goal. She was devoted to winning the gold medal. Bronze would not satisfy her desire. Bronze would not satisfy her desire. She went back and she trained four more years for the next event. She showed up in London for the next Olympics. She ran the best time that she had ever run in her life. Then she was satisfied. You know, when you, when you compete in the Olympics, when you compete in the Olympics, your goal is to medal, right? But the devoted athlete, that's not their goal. What's their goal? Gold. gold. Nothing but gold is going to satisfy me. She could have gone home, take that bronze medal that she won in the Olympics in 2008, hung it on the wall and said, I am an Olympic champion. But she knew in her heart she would have to say, I am an Olympic bronze medal champion. Four more years of dedication, four more years of work to come back and win the gold. That's a beautiful picture of what, what God expects for us. Not perfection. Hear that loud and clear. Not perfection. You will never be perfect. But he does expect us to be devoted. And if I'm going to be devoted to him, I want to finish with a gold medal. How about you? I want to take you to a couple of biblical definitions for that, for that word devoted. If you'll stay with me for a few more minutes. Take your Bibles real quick. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. What does that look biblically? I've given you an earthly definition of devoted, being single-minded, being focused upon one goal. But what does that look like in biblical context? Turn to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Get back to Romans. Get out of Deuteronomy. Turn to Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. Paul says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren... By the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of, what's the next word? Worship. How, how can I tell if I am a devoted gold medal believer? Then I have a heart of worship. And here's the thing. Does circumstance determine your worship? Yeah, we say no with our mouth. <laughs> but I'll be the first one to raise my hand that it does in my life. It does in my life. But can I worship him in the storm and worship him on the heights and worship him in the valley and worship him in the darkness and worship him in the light and worship him when I'm rich and worship him when I'm poor? Paul managed to have that. He says, I've learned in all circumstances to be what? Content. I've learned how to be rich. I've learned how to be poor. I've learned how to have much. I've learned how to go hungry. But in the midst of that, my heart is still that of worship. Uh, put me in a prison and let me begin to sing praise songs at midnight. And then we can talk about worship. Secondly, join me real quick in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. You're going to go to the right, one book, I think. Chapter 6, verse number 20. It says, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God. Glorify God in your body. Hmm, I see, a, I see a stream here, don't you? I'm to worship God. I'm to glorify God. What, is the word, what do you think about when I say glorify God? What do you think about? Exalt. Exalt, to lift up, to magnify. Have you done that yet today? 
So we say if we really want to be a devoted believer in Jesus Christ, if we really want to accomplish what God says, hey, if you want all this, then you must be totally sold out, heart, soul to me. Then I learned that I must worship Him no matter the the circumstance. I must glorify Him above everything else. Lastly, let's, let's look at Proverbs. Find the book of Psalms. Go one book to the right. In my Bible, you're in the book of Proverbs. Third proverb, chapters three, chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. It says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. In other words, uh, let's see, 15th was like last Wednesday, right? That's affirmative. Or Tuesday, sorry. That's affirmative. It's one of those days, whatever. Looked in our checking account. We got paid. Praise God. Thank you. We got paid. The very first fruits that came out of what we got went to the Lord. That's what, that's what it says here in the book of Proverbs. It says, honor the Lord. How do we honor Him? We honor Him by placing Him first and say, listen, I'm going to trust you for everything else, but I'm going to honor you. I'm going to glorify you. I'm going to worship you. But if you notice, it says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with, what's the next word? Plenty. And your vats will overflow with new wine. Think about that for a second. Though, when you want to talk about devotion, we say we're not expected to be perfect, but we are expected, expected by God to be devoted okay, to Him. We do that by worship. We do that by glorifying His name. And we do that by honoring Him in everything that we do. Everything that we do. The last thing I'm going to share with you is a quick story from one biblical context where we see two devoted people in that one context. Join me in Luke, the Gospel of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, third Gospel. Off to your right a little bit. Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, we're going to run into two people that are really devout, really devoted. They they meet the the expectations of God in the book of Deuteronomy, turn to me with all your heart, with all your soul. They also meet that expectation of worship and glorifying and honoring. And one is a priest and the other is a widow. Jesus' parents are taking taking him where in Luke chapter 2? Temple. For what reason? They're going to dedicate him because the first child out of the womb is to be dedicated to the Lord, right? In other words, get that picture? First one out of the womb, dedicated to me, okay? All right, get back in the book of Proverbs, okay? So they're fulfilling the law. But the first person we meet is actually found in Luke 2, 25-32. Listen as I read. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous, and what's the next word? Devout. Wow. Wow. If, if Scripture was going to say anything about you, would it say righteous and devout? Let's not go there. Looking for the consolation of Israel. In other words, he's looking for the Messiah. It says the Holy Spirit was upon him. Hold on a second. I didn't think that happened until the book of Acts. It says the Holy Spirit was upon him. You've got to understand the context. It was upon him, but it wasn't in him. It was upon him. Okay? And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Can you, how many of you would cling to a promise like that? How many of you are still clinging to a promise that God made to you a long time ago? Raise your hand. I got my hand. I, I put two up for that because I got two that I'm still praying on right now. God, you said it's going to happen. And every once in a while, in his magnificence, he'll just nudge me in the ribs and say, let me remind you what's going to happen. And then he gives me a little bit clearer picture of how it's going to happen. Not the whole picture, because that would devastate me sometimes. But he gives me a little bit more picture, a little bit more of the picture, a little bit more of the picture of what's going to happen. Well, we find this, this man. He says, looking for the consolation of Israel, the Holy Spirit was upon him, been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. He came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then this man took him in his arms and said, you've got to be kidding me. This is who I've been waiting for? This, this baby needs to be changed. This is it. 
This is what I get for all my devotion? This is what I get for being righteous? This is how you're going to fulfill this promise? This is how you're going to fulfill my prayer? Isn't a child, do you know who his parents was, by the way? There's some rumors about this couple right here. Okay? That's not what the Bible says. Notice. He looked beyond who Jesus was to who Jesus is. When it says this, it says he took him in his arms and said, Bless God and said, Now, Lord, you're releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. Now, hold on a second now. If he is a Jew, He's got it figured out, hasn't he? He goes on to say, Which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Jew? No, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Now see, what we catch here is a glimpse of something I've learned this week in my prayer life, okay? How many of you have ever, ever had God answer a prayer in a way other than you had prayed? But it got answered. Hands down. You know, God, God kind of dealt with me, I think it was yesterday. I answered your prayer, prayer and you're going to be questioning the way I answer it? Didn't I answer your prayer? And then you're going to question the way I answer it. See, God has the ability, the authority, the right to answer our prayer any way he wants to, right? We just have to be willing to accept the way that he answers it. Just like this guy had to accept the way that he answered his prayer. It comes in the form of a baby instead of a grown man. But he sees who Jesus will be. Let's meet one more person. We'll be done. Look in Luke chapter 2, verse 36 and 38. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phineel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. In other words, they were married seven years before he passed away. And then as a widow at the age of 84. Why, you do the math. You do the math. If she got married at a normal age for her time and she lived with her husband for that few years and then she'd been in the temple this long, it says she never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayers. And at that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak to him, to all, uh, speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. She got it, didn't she? Would, would you say that she was a devoted person to, to, to God? Yes. Amen. It would have been so easy for her to say, you're going to let me find a man of my dreams. You're going to give me so, so few years with him, and then you're going to take him away, and you expect me to live as a widow in this society. He says she spent the rest of her life living in the temple, serving in the temple, praying in the temple, holding on to the promise of the coming Messiah. And then God, in that magnificent time, in that same day, these two people are in the temple together, and they both get their answer to their prayer at the same time. And they don't miss it. And they don't miss it. They embrace it. And that's Paul's passionate prayer for the Jew. Embrace this Messiah's come. Embrace the Messiah's come. Ian Bounds writes this. He says, The men and women who have done the most for God in this world have been early on their knees. The one who fritters away their early morning is its opportunities and freshfulness in other pursuits and seeking God will make poor headway seeking Him the rest of the day. Those men and women who have truly impacted society for Christ have been those who have paid the price getting up, getting with Christ first thing in the morning. Charles Simeon is an English pastor devoted the hours from four in the morning till eight. Anybody else here up at four o'clock this morning? Hands? Okay. My, my, my alarm clock goes off at 529. That gives me 60 minutes to rest for it. 60 seconds to rest for I have to get up. Charles Simeon, an English pastor, would get up at four in the morning. He'd spend the first four hours in the morning with God. Go back and read the impact he had for Christ in the world. John Wesley spent two hours daily in prayer. He began at four in the morning. Do you begin to see a theme here? He began at four in the morning. 
of him who knew him well wrote this. He thought prayer to be the more his business than every, anything else. Martin Luther, if I fail to spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets the victory throughout the day. Wow. But I want to leave you with this final thought. I've taken you to a biblical account of what devotion looks like. I've taken you to two lives that live out that biblical account of devotion. I've taken you to some more recent ones who have been devoted. So what, what's it going to be today for you? Are you going to be one that's just glad you made it to the Olympics? I guarantee you the next Olympics, whenever they be, if you sit down and talk to one of those who have made it there, they're not ever going to tell you this. I'm just glad to be here. Now they're going to say, I've come to medal, and I've come to win the gold medal. Because if they don't have that kind of passion in their heart, they're not going to make it to the Olympics. Somewhere along that four-year journey, they're going to phase out. You know, when that alarm clock goes off at 3 o'clock, they've got to go get in a swimming pool before they go to college, before they go off to work. And they do that day after day after day after day after day after day. Just for that, in this lady's context we studied today, looked at today, for a race that lasted less than a minute. So are you willing to just be in heaven? I'm just glad I'm going to heaven. Or he said, no, I want to go through the gate wearing a gold medal. I'm not going to be satisfied with bronze. I'm not going to be satisfied with silver. God says, it's not hard to do. And it's not out of your reach. And it's not difficult. But you've got to be devoted to me. That's what it's going to cost you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father, how the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, can take us uh, to the law, but then take us back to the original intent of the law in the book of Deuteronomy, taking one Moses, who his Jewish readers were very well versed in, taking us to a, a book, Deuteronomy, they were very well versed in, would have committed to memory. He says, listen, even here is a signpost that points to one, that points to one that's coming, that's going to fulfill the law for you. So I pray especially for those in our sanctuary today, those that may be listening to us or looking at us through Facebook. Answer this very simple question. Answer this very simple question. Do you have Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? If the answer is no, that is the very first step. It's like Bobby Bowden. If you miss first base, you've missed everything. The first, the first base has to be establishing that relationship with Jesus Christ. There will be a number on your screen. All you have to do is call that number. Somebody will answer the phone. They will get you together with one of our church family members, a man with a man, woman with a woman. Meet in the comfort of our church facility, wherever you would like to meet us. Let us have a few minutes with you in the scriptures. And we can show you how you move from being expectations of perfection to just being a truly devoted follower of Jesus Christ. That is what God expects. Bless those who are here today. I thank you for their faithfulness being here. Thank you for restoring us back to this sanctuary. Thank you for the great weather that we'll experience here in the next few minutes for our 10 o'clock drive-in service. Father, we do this because we want to honor you, glorify you, do everything that you ask us to do in this life. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Father, we give you thanks for those gathering in this place. As we give our tithes and offerings today, let us be reminded. Tell us in the book of Proverbs to honor you with the wealth that you've given us. Make you first place in everything. So we do that even in our tithes and offerings. Amen. You are dismissed.